So welcome. Uh, I, I think usually it's my, my turn to sit on the panel. So I think last time, time around, James, uh, I was in the hot seat. Yeah. So I, I think there's been a, a fascinating session. I want to bring the energy back. Uh, I, I'd say being a, a banker, uh, it's a little bit scary hearing that one of our fellow banks says that 50% of retail banking revenue is going to be at risk over the next couple of years. Uh, what I also found fascinating from the sessions uh, we seem to have this new form of relationship manager that's coming in. So, you know, James, you talked a lot about this relationship between fintechs and banks. It's not all about disruption, which is quite refreshing if you're working for a bank. Well, as long as you're working for the right bank. Yeah. I want, I want. DBS is one of the right banks. For so, so I think the, the focus for the panel, we've got a, a lot of students here and one of the major reasons why we set up the CalTalk as a platform is to uh, bring together academia. So we've got Dr. Wong on the panel to bring together banks. So uh, Ralph is the, uh, the banker on the panel today and, and also bring together the startup community. And I think it, it brings together great perspectives. And I think with everything that the, the founders have gone through in the talks today, I can sense in the room a tre tremendous amount of curiosity as to what this all means for future careers in banking, fintech, and finance. What does this all mean for us? So uh, for some of our students in the audience, you're probably thinking about what career choices do I make? Um, let me say to you at the outright, uh, D DBS has a fantastic digital graduate program, so <laughs> I have to do it too. And we've got a number of our, number of our digital grads in the audience here. Um, but, but the fact is, you know, the world is changing. And uh, fintech is, is also presenting opportunities for many of the graduates today. So I, I really wanted to, to start out, I think each of you have given a, a really great uh, introduction to your companies and, and what you do. I'm just going to launch straight into the question. So first one is, is really for Ricardo and, and Mukesh. Uh, given the graduates today are now presented with all of these career choices, what advice uh, would you give graduates as well as uh, the bankers that are mid-career today and not, not making any fun of your uh, age, but you don't look fresh out of university. <laughs> uh, in terms of considering a career in fintech, and what, what are the skills that you're looking for as you look to scale up your businesses? Uh, first, coming to students. You have something which uh, I don't have as a mid-career mid banker, is to make errors. I joined banking when I just graduated way back in 1992. Uh, that time banking was evolving. There were no books. There were no guidelines. We were writing the rules of banking ourselves. Believe me, it was a startup world in 1992. There was no consumer banking in Asia at that time. We didn't know how to give credit cards. We didn't know how to install ATMs. I have literally picked up ATMs in my uh, office, put in a car, and gone and installed with five engineers, and then put cash and waited for customers to withdraw and realized that they were withdrawing extra cash or the machine was dispensing extra cash. Or when we did a loan, the customers didn't pay back. We sold the loan, we collected everything. That was those days when we learned banking, really. Today, when you join a big company, Banking is a very standard world. There are rules, there are processes. You have to just follow it. Uh, so it's a great place if you want to like, like to do that on a daily basis, very secure for a certain period of time only. But if you want to learn and rapidly expand your horizon, take a little bit of risk. Don't worry about what your parents and what your neighbors would say or the guys who get a job at the biggest bank and get a salary immediately, which is much better than yours take risk. And for the mid-career uh, bankers, wish you all the best. Hope 2016 <laughs> is not when you are on the list of people. It's not your fault. Believe me, it's not your fault. You may be a great banker, but I have seen, they would say, this side of the floor goes tomorrow. Today, only Barclays Bank has announced across Asia Pacific, they're shutting down their equities trading. Now, those equity traders didn't do anything wrong. They were all brilliant people from the best universities. But the companies are changing rapidly, and you do not have a say. So 
mid-career bankers, get yourself reoriented, start taking risks before that ax falls on you. Um, <laughs> I'm going to come from a slightly different angle. I don't think it's a binary, uh, um, a binary uh, um, answer. I think it comes down to what the opportunity um, offers you on both sides, whether it's within the investment banking world or commercial banking world and the fintech world. I think you should keep your eyes open on both sides. Um, if you look at my uh, experience and what I went through, um, the stuff that I know for what it's worth, um, I learned within, I come from the investment banking world, the trading world, the brokerage world. Um, the stuff I learned at, um, I spent quite a few years at Goldman Sachs. I learned a hell of a lot of stuff there um, that I wouldn't have learned if I'd just gone straight into um, a startup. Um, so if you're given the opportunity to go work at a premier institution, um, be it in investment banking or even in the commercial banking world, I think you should continue to look at it very seriously um, because the programs that you have there and the things that you learn there uh, are things that you might not particularly learn uh, within a less structured um, startup company. Um, having said that, um, in the old days, you probably never would have looked at uh, a startup. Um, and I think those times have now changed. So you can learn a lot more things. You can potentially learn a lot of things within a startup. And, and it's not something that you should say no to. You should definitely look at it. But as Mukesh says, you are definitely taking more risk. Um, and I continue to be a big proponent of the fact that you've got to learn something before you throw yourself into a different uh, environment where you potentially won't get um, the experience and the background um, that you get at a, a traditional um, uh, financial, let's call it a financial company. Um, but at the same time, you've got fantastic, fantastic uh, uh, opportunities within picking the right potential company um, that is going to do exceptionally well, be it um, you know, some of the P2P lending type companies. Um, and what you will do in those companies if you're lucky enough uh, to get the opportunity and pick the right company, um, and it goes two ways. Obviously, it's difficult to get a good job um, and a good opportunity, and there's a big element of luck to that. But if you do get the right place, um, you will um, have, uh, it, it'll be a much more dynamic environment. Um, it will be fantastically, uh, uh, invigorating, you'll find it just, you know, you'll jump out of bed in the morning and want to go to work. Um, and you're always thinking about things. You're doing a lot of different things. You're not just doing one small thing within uh, a more traditional banking environment um, where you tend to just do one thing. You know, whatever part you're doing in commercial or investment banking, you tend to, generally speaking, sort of specialize in that area. And then once you know your job, you don't really learn that much after that. You tend to do the same thing um, after a period of time. I think a startup and a fintech, um, or a fintech, any type of startup, uh, you're always doing new things. You've got to. You've got to be innovative. Your brain's always um, thinking of things. So if your DNA is more entrepreneurial, your DNA is, DNA is more into the world of let's figure out things, let's work as a team, how can we do this? You will be able to exercise those things and potentially implement them. While in the former, you tend not to be able to do that. You know, it's sort of you're, 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 you're a small part of a big machine. Um, so that's, that's pretty much my insight. Great. I, I might segue into a, a question for James now. So I think, I think James, uh, obviously these new alternative lending models are appearing by the day. A lot, a lot of people in the industry talk about this relationship between banks and fintechs as a, a kind of an uncomfortable union. On one side we've got Makesh here talking about disruption and more efficient use of capital and on the other hand you're talking about partnership. Uh, what skills do you think it has taken to build those partnerships with banks uh, and can it really work? Uh, I, I think firstly actually I, I don't think myself and Mukesh are kind of as far apart as, as perhaps our respective presentations suggested. I mean I, I'm not he up here saying that banks are doing things well 
for the most part they're not. Customer experience is very poor. There's a lack of transparency on FX. There's a, there's a bunch of problems with, a, with most bank products for the simple reason that by virtue of being an incumbent, by virtue of having a relatively protected market share for all these years, they've just simply gotten lazy and indifferent to their customers to a large degree. So I'm not here defending banks. What I'm, what I'm saying is banks have a lot of smart people working in them. They have a lot of shareholders to whom they're beholden. And the reality is, you know, I, I think we're going to see over the next couple of years, and in fact we're already seeing, that the smarter, more dynamic institutions are waking up to the fact that younger um, you know, consumers who are used to the kind of user experience and, and ease and lack of friction of, you know, we mentioned Apple, Google, all this kind of stuff, that their demands uh, from their financial services providers are, are comparable. So I'm not, I'm not defending the status quo. What I'm saying is I think the, the most likely next few years that we're going to see are partnerships between the more dynamic bank, banks and insurance companies and the startups. The banks insurance companies recognize that they've got certain competitive advantages. I mean, the, the, the utilization of capital is actually a different topic, which we can address if anyone wants to, but it's not really what I was saying. But the, the, the point is, like, banks have certain advantages, not least of which is cheaper access to money, distribution, data, so on and so forth. But the smarter ones, and I genuinely am not just promoting it because I'm here. DBS, I believe, from, from Piyush, the CEO on down, are one of the institutions that recognize, hey, we better, we've got some good things and we've got some bad things. So in order to address some of the you know, speed to market, user experience issues, why don't we go out to the market and see what some of these startups are doing, try and learn from them, try and partner with them. So DBS, I, I think I can reliably say or comfortably forecast, that's going to be a growing regional institution that I think we're going to see do well across a lot of these verticals. Some of the other banks are not going to do that because they are, as, as Mukesh rightly pointed out, kind of stuck in the past, you know, from a culture perspective, from a process perspective, and so on and so forth. Anyway, so my, overall, my overarching thesis, which isn't extremely original or, you know, insightful, is that I think we're going to see more and more partnerships between banks and fintechs. But actually, even broader than that, I think we're going to see more and more partnerships between banks and banks and fintechs and fintechs. So what I mean by that, even in the past you know, two or three weeks, we've seen CBA, Commonwealth Bank in Australia, form a partnership with Goldman Sachs on the equity side. Um, we've seen BNP Parada out here in Hong Kong uh, form a partnership with Nomura on the equity side. Now, the, the point here is, because of the, the issues we've discussed, which is the regulatory overhang in the financial sector, which has increased dramatically in the past 10 years, um, the cost of capital issues and so on that have been discussed, I think we're going to see more and more financial institutions try and um, project product and geographic reach through partnerships as opposed to the old HSBC, Citibank style, which is we're going to build a presence in every country on earth, and be, simply because the cost of maintaining that type of organization has become prohibitive from a technical perspective in terms of you know, sustaining that, that technical infrastructure and from a regulatory uh, perspective. So a bit of a long-winded answer, but suffice to say, you know, I, 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 you know, for me, I think the most exciting place is and I don't think it's contradictory to what Mikesh was saying. You rightly pointed out that all the big alternative lenders that we've spoken about have cut deals with big financing institutions. Lending Club, the biggest peer-to-peer -peer marketplace in the world, peer-to-peer no, -peer lender in the world, doesn't call itself a peer-to-peer -peer lender anymore. They are long past that. 90 plus percent of the money on Lending Club is institutional finance. It is Goldman Sachs. It is the banks. They're already the ones funding the money. So what Lending Club and what Mukesh, I think, is doing with Manexo is they are creating a better user experience. They're creating a better technology platform that is unencumbered with legacy systems and so on and so forth. So look, what I would caution, or what I, certainly what I would advise, is a lot of the fintechs who are out there to disrupt, disintermediate, you know, my own view is 80% of them are going to be selling to banks within a year. Um, and I think we're already seeing that global trend. Yeah. Okay, let, let me come back to the banker briefly. So I've got a, a question for Ralph. Uh, yes. Ralph, you've been one of the key architects of the DBS Accelerator, uh, right from the selection of the startups mm -hmm. through to the uh, demo day at the end of the program. And obviously you started your career, uh, I believe, in consulting yep. uh, and have been one of the, the really successful ones in the Hong Kong community and really creating this linkage with the startups. So what advice would you give some of our students and bankers out there in terms of uh, your lessons learned along that journey? Sure. So I, I think the key thing is I just, you know, when I create a program with David and I look back, like, you know, I have been working for like 10 years. So when I graduate, I think about, right, what should I do, right? But at that time, at that point of time, you never heard about like FinTech or startup or whatsoever. So basically what you did is like, you go to all the career talk, you listen to the, you know, big corporations and promote their program and see what fit you. 
So in your mind, you basically is just go directly to those corporations and apply the jobs. Instead of really thinking, hey, should we work for a startup or you know, be an entrepreneur, something like that. So um, when I create a program, actually I'm very lucky because you know, Ricardo is here and his company is recruiting a young graduate from CTU. So at that point of time, I just go to and ask him, right? Okay, why you just apply you know, a job from currency, a startup, a fintech startup, instead of you know, apply a job you know, for other banks or whatsoever? Right. Besides, Ricardo is a you know great CEO or whatsoever, but he should not know you, right? He just go to the website and you know do some research. So I asked him immediately why why you do so. So he told me because working, he believed that working in you know this company can give him more exposure. Okay, give him more exposure regarding how he can see the thing end to end instead of just become a small part. So actually, that clicks my mind. So I believe that as you know, a lot of young people is here, when you're chosen your job, doesn't care, really care about you know, what companies they are, but you need to know what's the job nature. Are you going to handle more exposure or are you just become part of the machine, which is really important. So from my point of view is that you find something that you're good at and at the same time give you good exposure. And I'm very lucky you know, in my career, no matter it's before and here in DBS, it gives me a lot of exposure, which I really like. And I think this is really important that when you chose your career, doesn't really think about you know, what company you work for, but think about the exposure and the learning that you can get. That's what I want to say. Yeah. Hopefully, I, I, because I need to be careful to regarding what I say, yeah. right? <laughs> <laughs> but it's true. This yeah. is true. It's think about the exposure. It's recorded yeah. live, Ralph. So. Yeah. <laughs> OK. Uh, Question for Dr. Wong. So uh, the Hong Kong government just announced a $2 billion uh, venture matching fund. Uh, and one of the quotes that I picked up in the media this morning was, the government will secure enough funding to support research and development activities in local universities. What does this mean for fintech and job creation in this exciting new sector? And do you believe it will be enough to attract startups to Hong Kong and to get the universities more engaged to help Hong Kong compete effectively to be an international fintech center? Uh, my, uh, the first response is uh, don't trust the government. <laughs> <laughs> of course, the government provides some seed money. Uh, this seed money is only seed money. Uh, personally, I anticipate banking sector themselves will provide a lot of uh, funding to support the fintech. So uh, as a, um, if you work in bank, you know that the now the, the, the overall banking sector is over-regulated. So probably bank will try to spin off some business and then partner with some external party like fintech company. So you should look for these opportunities. Any other thoughts from the panel? It's obviously dominated the press in the last few weeks. Yeah, I mean, I, I would definitely, I mean, we, we, we went through our Series A raise. I mean, I think people focus a lot on venture, on, on capital raising, and they see it kind of almost as a benchmark of success, which frankly it's not for several reasons. Um, I mean. You know, as I mentioned, the, the prior company, I, I, I'd been a consultant for a number of years, jumped ship to a, to a startup that never raised a penny, and that was how my boss was able to walk away with 100 million um, euro off the back of it. I mean, it's not always about raising money. Uh, I think we talk a lot about how there's a relatively immature venture capital market in Hong Kong. I believe that's true, but I also think sometimes, you know, people talk about government support and regulatory support and venture before they get around to deciding, you know, have they got a problem worth solving and have they built a team that's capable of solving it? I'm very much of the view that venture capital is uh, you know, global. If you've got a good product, if you've got a good team, you, you should, I mean, it's not guaranteed. There is a, you know, always luck involved in everything, frankly, but you know, hopefully you'll be in a position to, to, to source some capital. Um, so you know, I think it's a very useful signal to the market is how I would describe that. I think it's great you know, signal to say, look, you know, there, there's opportunity here. Hong Kong's a place to, to do it. I mean, you know, Singapore have been pretty aggressive in this from MAS on down and Temasek and so on. But look, governments don't create uh, viable businesses. Uh, VCs don't create viable businesses. Regulators don't create viable businesses. The only thing that does are, you know, people who are willing to put in a lot of hard work into solving a problem worth solving. And the reason I repeat that last bit is there's a lot of hype around fintechs. There's also a lot of hype around startups. I mean, a lot of this stuff is nonsense. 
I mean, you know, the amount of startups I see who frankly just do not have a viable business case, who have done no market testing, who don't understand how they're going to make money, if they'll make money, I mean, that's a waste of time. And if you think you're getting good experience in that position, just go work for a bank, go work for a consulting firm, and actually you can get that kind of level of experience while getting paid. Uh, I mean, you know, people who come to me and say, hey, I want to be in the startup, I say, you know, I have no interest. People who come to me and say, you know what, in, in my daily role in the bank or, you know, in my daily role as a student or whatever, I've seen, I, I've identified what I think is a problem. I think I might have a way of potentially solving it. Perhaps it's the application of technology. Perhaps it's a new process. But I think I'm going to try and build a business off the back of it. I say, great. You know what? And they're the guys who will get funded. They're the guys who will get traction. The idea of being in a startup for the sake of it is a total waste of time, and I, and I seriously wouldn't bother. Okay. Uh, James, James, I've just, just got Maybe one. Perhaps yeah, I could just add one yeah. thing to that. I agree with James entirely, um, uh, especially on the, uh, you know, the, the tail end of what he was talking about. I think it's uh, specific to this. I haven't really read that much about it, um, but the Hong Kong government, I think it's very important um, to fund companies or uh, organizations which are justified by a business justification as opposed to just... Um, allocating capital um, to research, okay? Um, and I, I, I have a little bit of experience uh, looking at the, the old SERAP um, uh, research funding that the Hong Kong government, I think they recently shut it down, uh, whereby it was nothing to do with a business justification. It was purely um, uh, uh, giving out funding to companies for the sake of research. Uh, which I don't think is the way it should be done. I'm not saying you shouldn't get funding at universities for research and there are certain industries um, like medical type research where, where you, you have to allocate capital. Um, um, but specifically in technology um, uh, type companies, uh, FinTech is an example, there has to be an economic rationale for why you're giving money to, to that business and the innovation will come as a result of a business justification, a problem that's being solved exactly as James uh, highlighted, and that's the way it should be allocated. Uh, and the people also allocating that capital should understand business, um, uh, you know, and have some experience um, in understanding what they think collectively uh, is justifiable um, in terms of allocating um, that money. Excellent. So I'm going to come back to Mukesh. Uh, tricky question. So the World Economic Forum has just published a, a report on the future of jobs. And Oxford University also published a study looking at the impacts of uh, digital disruption, artificial intelligence, these kind of technologies. So one of the areas that uh, banks have traditionally employed lots of people is in the area of credit underwriting. And some are predicting machines and robots uh, are going to take all those jobs away. Now, obviously, in your business, uh, your credit models and credit scoring is a, a critical component of what you do. Uh, any advice for the, for the graduates? And do you believe the future of credit scoring is going to be done by robots? Uh, did we imagine uh, 10 years back that there will be driverless cars? No. So can you imagine with driverless cars, which is much more complex, believe me, than sitting in a closed room with a bunch of papers doing credit underwriting. So if that is possible, and algorithm trading has been almost on for now a decade. Right? There are no more traders in a lot of jobs, no more night shifts, no more people handing over to each other over from one geography to another. This is going to happen. Machine learning, robotics, and these costs have just crashed. Like I'll give you an example. The kind of system we built at City would have costed millions of dollars way back in 1994 and they had a shelf life of only two, three years and then we had to rewrite them because scale was going. Today with cloud computing, today with all the technology available, the prices have come down so drastically that I can take my own money and start a company like this. It was not possible. So you guys are living in a golden era. I didn't have that opportunity. I didn't even have a Pentium 286 access to getting to a Pentium 286 took me to go, go into a bank and working for them. That was the first time I felt a computer and got an email ID. <laughs> right? So you have access, you've grown up with these technologies and you guys are superior to us in many, many ways. You're going to write the history one more time which we can't even fathom. Uh, recently I heard about uh, a research, not a research, actually a 
question which is being asked by a person who travels quite a, extensively, and he asked a question, how many of people think there'll be a flying car coming out? And in US, 95% of the audience said yes. And when he did the same thing in Hong Kong, not one person picked up their hand, right? So we can't even think if there's a flying car, driverless car, credit jobs are gone, history. James, you, you got a comment? Yeah, um, I mean, uh, I mean, uh, you know, I, I agree. Look, the, 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 the progression of things, I think absolutely there'll be much more automation, all these things. There's going to be much more automation in everything. I, I, I mean, to, to jump on which Mukesh made, which I completely agree with, I mean, the reality, all this fintech stuff, and again, let's extract the hype a little bit, really what we're talking about is computing power. So there's always been the application of technology to financial services since the abacus. People have been figuring out new ways of applying technology to financial services. The difference in the last 10, 15 20 years, really 10 years, is suddenly the cost of computing power has fallen off a cliff. The access to it, cloud computing, you know, so on and so forth, is such that you or I can actually begin to build product that is conceivably financial services or service or, 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 or a product in that in that field. That's really what this change is all about. It used to be that only the incumbents, only the big banks and insurance companies were in a position where they could build these kind of products, and increasingly that has been democratized. That's a huge change. We're seeing it across every industry. We'll continue to see it. I'm not that worried about those, well, I mean, it's easy to say, I'm not that worried about those jobs being lost because I think the create, what, what this is, a, uh, you know, the, the um, creativity that is unleashed by virtue of access to this computing power is actually, we can't, we're gonna lose all these jobs that we're aware of. We can't even imagine the jobs that are gonna be created 10 or 15 years from now, the rate of, the rate of increase in, in, in terms of computing power and so on and so forth. So I'm not overly concerned about it. I think the key thing in the future economy is to be creative. Um, to, to take a genuine interest and enthusiasm in what you're doing, to try and learn about the role you're doing, but also about the role the guy beside you is doing, about the company strategy, about all of that kind of stuff. So whether you go work for a big firm or a startup, I think, um, you know, my own view is certainly that curiosity and enthusiasm are pretty much the two key drivers for the success of your career. You're starting out at a university, don't bother optimizing for the highest wage. That'll come down the tracks when you're much more experienced, when you've got the knowledge. You want to optimize for knowledge up front. Um, the only other thing I would say, which I think is kind of, I like to talk about the specific uniqueness of Hong Kong in many ways, because a lot of this is kind of general, you know, e even in our field, in, in terms of alternative lending and so on and so forth. You know, I think what Hong Kong needs to do as a fintech hub and a startup hub and all that stuff is really think about what is, Hong, what is unique about Hong Kong. So, you know, we know the whole gateway to China thing, blah, blah, blah. I mean, you know, that'll increase in, in certain regards, but it'll absolutely decrease in other regards. I mean, that, that's just the, the, the reality. Um, you know, what, what I mean from an economic impact perspective and so on and so forth. But actually Hong Kong as a trading port, you know, uh, as our proximity to Shenzhen, for example, like, you know, I'm always on the lookout for interesting startups that I can support either financially or otherwise. And, you know, it strikes me that a lot of the startups I've seen are just kind of copycat of, well, we saw someone in the States do it or we saw someone in Europe do it, so why not in Hong Kong? And, you know, that's not that exciting because you're not really capitalizing on any of the advantages that this city has. So, you know, I, you know, I just ask my friends and some of the stuff I'm associated with, like, where, do I, where are all these drone startups? So how come I don't see enough drone startups in Hong Kong? 80% of the world's drones are made 40 kilometers up the road, yet I don't see anyone in this space down here. It's crazy. I mean, our DGI founders obviously from Hong Kong, but you know, they've gone to Shenzhen. I'm like, who is building ancillary services for this? You try and imagine a future in 20 years, you know, credit scoring is the uninteresting part. I'm talking about a future of drones are doing basically everything, right? I mean, who's building product and services to deal with the chaos that that could pot potentially look like? You know, other things, tr trade finance. I mean, you know, as Ricardo rightly said, I mean, Hong Kong is a trading hub, it's a deep history in, in kind of cross-border trade, remittances. Who's doing cool stuff in remittances? Trade finance. Like, these are the kind of things that I'm looking at for, saying, you know, this isn't just something that, that, that I've seen in the U.S. that I want to bring. Oh, by the way, that's not a terrible model. That copycat model isn't necessarily bad. I think there's a lot of opportunity in it. But it's, it's, as, it's a little bit harder to get excited about Hong Kong as a hub unless we're capitalizing on the strengths of the market. Because the final thing I'll add is, I mean, this is 7 million people. This is, you're going to have to think international from the outset. If you have actually any ambition to build a business, Hong Kong is not going to be your final destination. It's going to be a jumping off point into Southeast Asia, uh, into mainland China or into wherever else. So you're going to need to think big from the outset. So start thinking about some of those uh, big challenges. Just, just want to add on what James mentioned is um, when I work with you guys is I always think Hong Kong is a good testing bed 
to test out your ideas because you know we have a good infrastructure, our telco infrastructure excellent. You know we have a pretty strong banking system, so you can test out the ideas and then see if it's work. Then you can roll out to other system, other countries, right? So, and for the talents in Hong Kong, we have a strong math base and engineering, engineering, computer science knowledge. So it definitely can help us to transform because just look like you know. 20 or 30 years ago, we are pretty keen in doing manufacturing, right? But now we go to surface industry. So let's see Hong Kong is very dynamic that we can change, we can adopt. So that's how I see. Okay, yeah. right, we've got a couple of minutes left. I wanted to open up to the floor, see if uh, we've got anyone itching to ask a question. I've got a few left in my inventory of questions here. Uh, anyone begging to ask any of the panel members a question? If not, I'm no, going to pose I, one. I want to ask a question on behalf of the student. Right? Sure, go ahead. Now, uh, today we have uh, two sp uh, three speakers uh, sharing their entrepreneurship. Right? Um, but uh, when you look at their presentation, they, they are very successful in identifying some business gap. So, but for that is a young graduate, they have no business experience. So what sort of advice uh, you can provide to them to, in order to prepare them for the fintech uh, industry? Well, I'll be a little uh, unpopular and contrarian again to say, actually, I think, you know, this startup fetish that we're all going through and that everyone wants to be Silicon Valley and so on, I think there's something to that, as I say, you know, we, everyone talks about Uber and everyone talks about Airbnb, but you know what the reality is, getting a cab, if, if, my Air, if my Uber doesn't turn up and I need to get a cab instead, it's not life or death. There's a reason the last three big verticals that have yet to be disrupted in any real meaningful sense are financial services, health, and education, because they're the three most important things in your life now and forever. So I don't want to get overhyped on the whole startup thing. The reality is if you want to disrupt those three industries or you want to contribute meaning, meaningfully to those three industries, the absolute likely probability is that you're going to need some experience working in those industries. So if you want to build, I always use the example, if you want to build a food delivery app, you know what? it's probably pretty straightforward, like, you know, how much is there to know? Obviously, you're going to have to build the app, you're going to have to figure out the logistics and the food and so on and so forth, but you don't need any real experience in that industry in order to do it. If you want to build something in financial services, you know, unless you're, you know, you could be a Mark Zuckerberg-esque genius, they're the kind of 0.001% and kind of figure it out, but actually fintech leaders or fintech founders tend to have experience in financial services because you and I both know it's an extremely complex, very opaque industry, and if you want to solve for a specific problem within that industry, you're going to have to know about it on the ground. So that's why, personally, I'm much more excited about founders who come to me and say, hey, I've got five, ten years' experience working in this particular niche, in this particular vertical of financial services. I know from my daily job that this is a problem, and I know, I think I know how to solve it. Because right there, you've got a validated business case, and you've also got a potential first client. That's exciting. Some guy rolling out, some guy or girl rolling out of college saying, I want to, you know, create a new <laughs> whatever, right, fintech product, frankly, it's extremely difficult to have any real validated sense of whether that's realistic or not. I'm not trying to put the dampeners on that. I think, as Mukesh said, you've extremely, I mean, you've nothing to, to lose, frankly, at that stage of your career. And I think perhaps a really important aspect here is that all these big banks and insurance companies and so on and so forth, the types of people they're going to be looking for now and into the future are people who take risks are people who are genuinely curious and interested. So if you go out and you try something and it fails after a year, 10 years ago that would have been seen as a failure in, in terms of, you know, you, you then apply to the bank and they're like, well, hang on, what did you spend this 12 months doing, building an app and it didn't get off the ground? Now that experience is really going to stand to you. So, you know, I'm not making one, it's very much on an individual basis, whether you want to go work for a big corporate and figure out whether it's the problem you want to solve or maybe you want to stick with the corporate or whether you want to start something now. I would just caution that fintech, medtech, and edtech, the three big verticals that have yet to be really disrupted, I mean, there's a reason for that. Yeah. Uh, I'll just reg, like... Reg tech as well. Well, reg tech. <laughs> by the way, get into reg tech. If I'm going to put my money in here, it's reg tech. I mean, if, right. if you can do anything to solve regulatory burden for financial institutions, <laughs> people will buy you in the morning. Yeah. Sure. Red tech, right? Yeah. yeah. So good. And, and to the point of James, if you see most of fintech founders are mid-career bankers in mid-40s. Very few of them are straight from the college. Uh, having said that, there are niches which you guys understand much better than mid-40 uh, bankers. User experience, mobile first. You guys have that talent which, frankly, I don't have. I, 
I started using mobile at the age of 36, 37. You guys have been using from your childhood and you guys know the next generation of customers who are coming in, how they interact with it. That's a skill set which I'm looking for. Any startup is looking for, specifically in that space. So if you have that skill set, you're very valuable, very, very valuable uh, skill set which you have. Try and bring that. Yes, it's very hard to come out of college and first say I'm going to do fintech because it's very regulatory demanding, as well as your credibility. If you try and raise money to fund yourself, it's going to be very difficult. Plus, you will not know how to get the customers initially. Uh, you can build the best platform. Customer acquisition still remains a challenge. Customers don't know you. Customers don't trust you. The trust, 150-year-old institution can do wrong things, but customers and we all will trust them. But a new company does one thing wrong, and it's tarnished for life. So you've got to be very careful with that. Okay, with that, I think we are out of time. Uh, I, I, I see some of you itching for questions. What, uh, well, I know uh, some of our founders will be staying around after the talk tonight, so feel free to uh, interrogate them with your questions. I want to thank uh, the audience. I want to thank the organisers. I want to thank, of course, the founders and Dr Wong for joining us on the panel session. Big round of applause. Thank you.